Why would a political scientist write a biography? Because we're trained to look at large data and we're trying to make, you know, make predictions and so forth. And I think the argument is that writing biographies allows me to look at agency and looks at and looks at how power is wielded and how that and how uh, decisions are made and where those agents, the president, national security advisor, and his top national security team, are able themselves to design the structure, the NSC process, the interagency committees, and how and fit the personnel. So you sort of see the where all of the parts of government come together. And unfortunately, because we don't have systematic data on national security advisor or national decision make national security decision making, then we have to somehow somehow find a way into this. And I think biography and looking at say a national security advisor or someone who's looking at the foreign policy of several presidents say could get at some of these things that otherwise political science misses because again there are, we don't have you know we don't have good good data sets and we don't have comprehensive information yeah it was a convergence i was interested in how we got i was mid 2005, 2006, and I was interested in how we got from the, when I was grew up in the last third of the Cold War, and how do we got from there to the post 9-11 world where we are now. And I was thinking, well, this is a large arc of history. How do we cover this? And I was thinking, well, a lot of people had covered this. And I was also interested in how the national security policy making worked. But that would mean a very detailed study of different administrations, and that seemed very dry. And I was thinking, well, maybe if there's, I could tell this through somebody. And so I thought about Scowcroft, who was always aware of, but who people really hadn't stowed, focused directly because he had been in the background. And then the more I started reading and then talking to people, I realized he had this fascinating life. And so my, my first opinion of him, this is the answer to your third part of your question, is that, well, he was kind of this bureaucratic operator and kind of just this advisor and so forth. And because he hadn't gotten a lot of attention, I thought he was kind of just this facilitator or fixer even. And then the more I got into it, I realized that A, he'd had this amazing life, and that B, behind the scenes, he deliberately took attention away from the influence he'd had on a bunch of key important uh, episodes in American foreign policy history, really from the 70s to the present, including the, you know, the Gulf War, the end of the Cold War, the U.S. response to Tiananmen Massacre, and a bunch of things. Yeah, well, there's a strategist. It's not only sort of being able to, to um, advocate or pursue policies, but it's also being able to persuade others of you, of you, like the president. But I think more importantly, being a strategist is about figuring out how that policy relates to other policies. So how does financial or economic policy tie into um, conventional weapons or defense budgets? How does it tie into domestic politics and how you handle some different interests. I mean, you met with people all the time. And so figuring out how to juggle and to balance and how these things fit together, I think that's really what makes him a strategist because as national security advisor, you're seeing kind of all of national security policy. And some of this is domestic, whether it's public opinion or whether it's um, uh, defense industry or the, the Israeli lobby or it's the Polish Americans or Ukrainian Americans. All these things factor in as well as foreign powers and what's going on in different parts of the world. So. Well, I think it's both. I mean, it has to do with the structure about having these interagency committees, the deputies committee especially, but also the principal committees of the, just the foreign policy principles and of kind of organization and making it, and the most important point is to have the buy-ins and to have the deputies and their, their principals, that is the heads of the different departments and agencies, being on the same page and then those principals being able to talk and coordinate with um, national security advisor and the president. So it's partly the structure, but it's most importantly the relationship between the president and his national security advisor. And are they talking a lot? Do they agree? And so this is, you can think of um, well, the role of Condoleezza Rice or the role of uh, James Jones in recent administrations where there wasn't quite the same relationship that they had with the president or if there was that relationship, they didn't have the national security expertise and there wasn't that equality among the principals. So Condoleezza Rice was much more junior than Cheney and Rumsfeld and was kind of, um, you know, and they, they kind of ran things, they and the president. So.